Welcome to the New Books Network. Welcome back to New Books in Anthropology, a channel on the New Books Network. My name is Adam Bobek, and I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Leipzig. Today, I'll be talking to H. Glenn Penny about his new book, In Humboldt's Shadow, A Tragic History of German Ethnology. Professor Penny, welcome to the show. Thanks. It's nice to be here. To start off, would you mind telling us a bit about yourself and how you came to write this book? Sure. Um, So I'm actually a historian. Uh, Technically, I teach modern European history at the University of Iowa, but I spent a lot of my my career working on the history of anthropology and ethnology. Um, And a lot of it has turned around the history of museums. And I was actually at an institute for advanced study. It's called the Wissenschaftskolleg in Berlin in 2017. And uh, I went there to do a project on basically unbinding German history, which is decentering it from the nation state or decentering the nation state in its history. Uh, and I was working diligently on that project when uh, controversies just blew up over the Humboldt Forum in Berlin. And the Humboldt Forum is basically, it's kind of like a museum, but it's mostly a show place. And there was a lot of controversy that Germans were not mm, well, taking seriously their colonial background and actually engaging with the artifacts that were going to be on display. And as I was there listening to this, these debates, people kept saying to me, well, you know, you wrote a lot about the history of German anthropology. Maybe you should write an op-ed for the newspapers. Maybe you should take part in these, engage in these discussions. And which side would you be on? Would you be on the side of the people who are arguing for you know, a cosmopolitan background in the history of these this discipline in Germany, or the colonialists and the post-colonialists, um, the radicals. Would you be with the protesters? Would you be with the establishment? And uh, my response was, I'm not really with either group because I find that both of them are completely getting the history wrong and misusing it. So, after a lot of prodding from friends and colleagues, I decided to go ahead and just write a book that was accessible to a general public and would help basically anyone understand why on earth there's hundreds of thousands of objects in the Berlin Museum um, from all over the world, uh, why there's millions in Germany, what on earth the people who collected them thought they were doing, and, and what it is we could not and should be doing with them now. So, yeah, so basically I went to the people at the, <laughs> the Institute for Advanced Study. I said, I- I'm not going to write the book you guys brought me here to write. I'm going to write this other book. And they said, fantastic, this needs to be done. And, and that's what I did. Yeah, and and considering that the uh, the book is in English here, can you talk a little bit about the audience you have in mind? Sure. So, I, I mean, first, the audience was basically everyone engaged in the debates. I was hoping they would get their history right. And secondly, all the people listening to those debates in Germany. Um, but Germany is a very cosmopolitan place, and so is, so is Berlin right now. I mean, you can walk down the streets in Prenzlauer Berg, which is one of the one of the parts of the city, one of the neighborhoods, and you'll hear as much English as you hear German. Um, And a lot of people who came and heard my presentations, which were oftentimes in English because they're international audiences, kept asking me when an English version of the book would come out. So it made a lot of sense for me to do this. And at the same time, the the debates, the controversies around, around the Humboldt Forum, well, they aren't just limited to the Humboldt Forum. They basically, those debates reverberated across um, Europe, Great Britain, the United States, and it seemed to me there was a much broader audience who was interested in these questions of, of uh, ethnological collecting objects, uh, the colonial legacies, but also the question of what the objects are doing now and what we might be doing with them. Considering the, uh, the title here, can we get into a little bit of the difference between ethnology and anthropology for people who aren't acquainted with that? Sure. Uh, and it's basically... The difference is a very German one. Um, If you study anthropology for a long time, and this is still the case at the University of Iowa, the department is still made up of four fields, right? You still have biological anthropologists working with cultural anthropologists and archaeologists. And um, in Germany, there was a very clear distinction between people who did physical anthropology and people who would do what today we would call cultural anthropology or ethnology. And that was true in the that developed in the 19th century. So that you had, on the one hand, a lot of people who were physicians and natural scientists who were very interested in, in bones and bodies. Um, and then you had people who were very interested in questions of culture and philosophy and worldviews. 
And sometimes those were the same people, and sometimes they were different groups, but they definitely worked in different journals. And the museums were not places that housed a lot of bones and bodies, but rather they were the places where they put the the physical artifacts that they collected from all over the world. Now, that dis- there's some dis- I have to stop myself for a moment there and say that is a general distinction, but museums are crazy places. Sometimes they're all mixed together, and sometimes there were indeed collections of of bones um, together in the same place where you had the objects. But one of the big challenges, and if you read the book, I open with this story and kind of end with it as well. One of the big challenges for people who come from places like Hawaii today is trying to figure out, well, what happened to things that were taken from grave sites when they arrived in Europe and the bones went to one institution and the objects went to another? And how do you find them in these different places and bring them back together? So it's more complex. Yeah, and the the other thing, returning again to the title, is that it's a tragic history of German ethnology, indicating that there are multiple tragic histories of German ethnology here. Uh, and I'd, would you mind speaking a little bit more about that? Well, it, it, it's an interesting question. Though. The, the tragedy that I see, and the one that I wanted to highlight in the book, is that the people originally came up with the idea of creating these giant collections saw themselves as engaged in an empirical scientific project. It was a kind of inductive science rather than deductive. The idea was you need to gather a lot of data first and then help that use that data to figure out how people work, how people think, um, how they've developed over time or have they developed over time to see where commonalities are, where differences are. And so what the museums were supposed to be were basically gigantic laboratories, places where you collected data and you worked with the data, right? The whole point of the display wasn't to show it to a public. The whole point was to get the objects out on tables and in cabinets where you could engage in a vast comparative analysis. And this is what they started to do. And part of the tragedy is that as museums developed more generally, these ethnological museums were also transformed into showcases. And they stopped being those kinds of places where knowledge is produced and started being places where curators use objects to illustrate narratives that they deliver in didactic ways to interested publics. And that's problematic because it put most of the objects into cold storage. And one of the tragedies is that these hundreds of thousands of objects, which in many cases are the only historical texts that we have from various kinds of people, different groups, different cultures, different villages in some cases, uh, have been put into a kind of cold storage where they can't really teach us much of anything unless you are one of the very few researchers who happens to know about the existence of an object and are able to go to a museum and have it unlocked for you so that you can look at it. But most people don't realize that 90% of the collections are never on display. Uh, The other tragedy is that while there was a lot of support for this science in the 19th century, it dwindled in the 20th century. And that played off across generations where again and again and again, you had what I would call a lot of valiant curators and researchers and ethnologists who worked in these institutions, but had less and less support over the decades. And so if you read, for example, their grant proposals, their, um, their, calls for support to whatever institutions or governments were uh, were financing them, they keep trying and keep trying to recreate these institutions where they can produce knowledge and it never really plays out. So I wanted to, uh, to move in and talking about a little bit about the cast of characters because there's a, a rich cast of characters in this book. Um, so maybe to start off with, maybe we should talk a little bit about Alexander von Humboldt. Could you introduce us to him? Sure. I mean, first of all, there's a thousand and one great biographies on him. So I'm only going to give you the short shrift. Uh, the thing that's most important about Alexander von Humboldt and, and his brother Wilhelm von Humboldt is that they come out of this, this class of well-educated nobility at the end of the 18th century, the beginning of the 19th century. And they're mostly interested in what the Germans call Bildung, which can be translated in many different ways, sometimes just as self-edification. But it basically means that individuals can grow and extend themselves through study 
not just of books, but of places and things and peoples and experiences. So traveling becomes part and parcel of this whole experience of self-edification. And Alexander von Humboldt took this idea to a kind of extreme that set a bar for people that would emulate him over, well, generations. And he's most well known for his multi-year adventure, trip, exploration through the Americas, mostly the top part of South America and Central America up into Mexico. Then he goes through the United States and goes back to uh, goes back to Europe, actually to France. He does a lot of his, most of his writing in French initially, but ultimately ends up in Potsdam and in Berlin. Uh, and the thing that's important about Humboldt is he develops this idea. He lives this idea of going and seeing and collecting information and trying to pull together all of the interconnections of the natural world. So his last big project was called Cosmos, which I believe the subtitle is A Total History of the Universe, um, or something close to that. And this is the thing. He wants to see the vast interconnection between everything in the world. And he has these epiphanies where he recognizes, for example, as he's climbing mountains, that there's similar kinds of vegetation at similar altitudes in different parts of the world. There are these interconnections between barometric pressure and uh, humidity and rainfall and even wind uh, and different kinds of plants. And he sees this with animals and he starts to notice relationships between animals and plants and geology and geography. And I could go on. Um, But the bigger point is that trying to gather all this material from around the world and construct one total history of the globe is what he really wants to do and dedicates his entire life to doing. And then he inspires many other people to try and do just that. And the cask of characters who become ethnologists in Germany are essentially trying to do the same thing, but in one segment. So Adolf Bastian, who becomes sort of the father of German ethnology, he wants to write a total history of a unitary humanity. And that's the starting point, is that there's one human, there's one humanity. And he believes you can write a total psychological history of people, that you can get into the basis for how they take shape mentally, and you can do this through a vast comparative analysis. So he's going around the world trying to collect as much information as he can about people. And he spends 25 years of his life trying to do this. And he starts initially by collecting information, observations about individuals, but very quickly starts to move to the collection of objects because he realizes that most of the people in the world in the 19th century are not literate, but they're producing a lot of things. And the things can also be read as texts. The texts are also filled with information about people's worldviews. So what he wants to do is get a total history of worldviews, of people's ontologies, basically, is what we would say today. And then he inspires lots of others. And some of those people in the United States know very well, people like Franz Boas, for example, who's essentially generating and channeling a lot of Bastian's ideas. He's also highly influenced by Rudolf Virchow, physical anthropologist, pathologist, and also a statesman. Um, And then there are many, many others, and I I could list them as well, Uh, but I, I don't know how many you want to hear about. This is great. So we 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 talked. We've talked now about Alexander von Humboldt. We've talked a little bit about Otto of Bastian. I imagine we'll be talking about him a lot more, and uh, Rudolf Virchow. Um, after Bastian passes away at the beginning of the 1900s, his legacy stands in a little bit of a, a shaky position. Can you maybe introduce us now to Wilhelm von Bode and his role in all of this? Right. So Van Bode is most well known for being a modern museum man. And what that means is the kind of museums that most people who are listening to this would go into are the result of ideas that take shape during Bode's time, how museums are organized, the spatial relationships, you know, the idea that you go in and there's individual objects on display. Or if you go to an art museum, you'll see representative objects of different genres, different trends. Sometimes they're the trends of an individual artist. Sometimes the artist stands in for a movement. Um, And this is the kind of museum that people thought was best for publics, to educate publics about art or about natural history or about human histories. So what happens is that von Bode becomes the the head of the Berlin museums 
And when this happens, he would like to see the Berlin Ethnological Museum become much like these other museums, a place where you have exhibits for publics that showed representative artifacts from different kinds of people that would give the public some sense of what those people were like. And for Bastian, that's not what museums were about. So Bastian wanted his museum filled with everything he could get from all of these people, and Boda wanted representative examples. And as long as Bastian was alive, Boda couldn't change the museum. But once he died in 1905, um, he's no longer the director, and the other sub-directors who come in and start to run the museum then engage with Boda in a back and forth. And Boda basically controls the purse strings, and they control the way the museum looks. So there's a lot of debates about whether or not they should divide the research collections and a collection that's on show for the public. And the short story is eventually Boda gets his way. Eventually, by the time, um, by time, it takes a couple decades, but by the time it's over, what's going to happen is that the museum that Bastian built will become, the Germans would call a Schausammlung, or basically a display for public where you could see representative artifacts from all over the world, from different groups. The vast majority of the collections won't even be downtown in that museum. They'll be out in a suburb of Berlin called Dahlem, which is where they all are today. And what, well, they would call a depot or a set of research collections. And one of the people fighting Boda at this time was Felix von Luschan, right? Yeah, so Luschan is sort of, uh, I guess you would call him Bastian's right-hand man. He's the one who's he's in charge of the collections from Africa and what they at that time called Oceania, which was more or less what we think of as the Pacific today. And he essentially runs the museum while Bastian is out on his trips, which is pretty most much of the, pretty much most of the time. And he, along with the other directors of the individual departments, for the most part, continue to push back against von Bora and say they didn't want to get into these kinds of um, Schausammlungen. But at the same time, they were also modern museum men in a sense, and they saw value in creating collections that could be used to instruct all kinds of people. And those people might be students from the university, or they might be people who are going to go off and work in business in other parts of the world. They might be colonial troops, for example. So von Luschan, for example, he saw a lot of value in educating Germany's colonial troops. Germany becomes a colonial power in 1884. By that, I mean, starts to acquire non-European colonies. And von Luschan thought it would be a good idea to educate these people about the places they were going and the people live in those places. And he argued that the science of ethnology could play a role in doing that. Yeah, you, you definitely don't present him necessarily as a heroic figure. Von Luschan? Yeah, von Luschan. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I, the third chapter of the book focuses a lot on Felix von Luschan for a number of reasons. One is that he reminds us that these are complex characters. I mean, first of all, he's a, he is a German nationalist, but he's also Austrian. He's um, not a pacifist. He believes that, that colonialism and imperialism are, are pretty normal things and not necessarily bad things because the world has always been well, driven by warfare and acquisition and transformations are going to happen. But at the same time, he's not a racist. Just the opposite. He's an anti-racist. He writes books and books and books that argue that there is no such thing as race science. Uh, it's not been proven. He takes Darwin to task for his uh, arguments about uh, theories of national selection. He's completely opposed to anti-Semitism uh, and writes, again, strongly about this. And he actually contemns the excess of colonialism, even though he finds colonialism to be good. So... This is somewhat problematic for most people because they like simple stories in which there are white hats and black hats. But for Lushan, you know, I don't want to say shades of gray. That's not really what's going on. There's a different worldview that in order to understand it, you have to put yourself in his shoes at the turn of the 20th century. And that's what I try and do with the chapters to demonstrate to them. On the one hand, Lushan actually is very interested in collecting bones, but also objects. And I just told you there's a division, but he's one of the few who does this. He has a huge skull collection, which makes him seem like a pretty unsavory character. And yet he's also using the skulls to demonstrate that race science makes no sense because there's 
more variation with any particular group and cranial capacity than there is between the groups. And this is also something that one of his mentors, Rudolf Fierschel, argued as well. Um, so we tend to think that people who collected bones and collected skulls were racists who were trying to make arguments about hierarchies, but it turns out that Lushan is doing this, making the opposite arguments. And most people don't expect that. The other reason I wanted to put him at the center of the story is because he's very involved with the acquisition of the Benin bronzes. And the, he's the reason so many of those Benin bronzes end up in German museums, a huge percentage of them do, but also in other museums in the world. If you want to know why there's a very big, important collection at the Field Museum in Chicago, it's because Dorsey contacted Luchon to help him get the collection. And Luchon was on the ground when these objects were seized by the British during a punitive expedition to Benin City, which was the ultimate colonial conquest, I guess you could say. They brought them back, but not really recognizing what they had, the soldiers who had them in their backpacks and a lot of the officers who had them in their, I don't know, their foot lockers, as well as the British state itself, basically just put them on the market and sold them. And really not understanding the value, the material value, but also the historical value, um, the ethological value, the scientific value, uh, the cultural importance of the objects. They sold the ivory initially for the price of the weight of ivory not realizing that these incredibly intricately carved tusks might, might be worth more than just that. Um, Lushan figured this out very quickly. And what he did was get in on the ground floor of what became a, a tournament of um, escalating value to try and acquire these objects. And during, during the debates I was describing in 2017, and ever since then, the Benin bronzes have become sort of the poster children, if you could call them that, for arguments about the colonial character of ethnological collections in Europe today, and in Germany in particular. But the irony is that what Luchon does is actually save those collections from these markets in which they would have, these objects would have disappeared and ensured that they went into museums where they're held, where they can still be seen today, and now there's a huge movement to get them back to Benin. And the reason you can get them back to Benin is because Lushan got them into the museums in the first place. So one of the points I try to make with his character is, again, his, there's a guy who works with me named Stephen Warren, who's written an, an excellent essay. He does engaged um, community-engaged research uh, and works with American Indian groups. And he's written an essay called Salvaging the Salvage Anthropologists, uh, which he did together with one of these people he works with. And this is essentially what I was trying to do with Lushan, too, is to explain that in some ways what he was doing was highly problematic. But at the same time, he's left us with an amazing legacy because we learned an unbelievable amount from the Benin Bronzes. Yeah, I, I don't want to gloss over this. I, you, your book is brilliantly organized. Where Thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. Your book is brilliantly organized into, into five chapters. And e in each chapter, you end up highlighting um, either one object or a collection of objects that have found their ways into uh, German ethnological museums. And you sort of go through the histories of each of these objects or collections of objects. And so um, before we move on to the next section, maybe here, moving back to Bastian and von Luschan, I, I, I think it's important maybe to highlight the role that they played in gathering these objects, why gathering these objects were so important, and then maybe talk a little bit about this Faustian bargain that you refer to in the case of both of them. Right. So the, the idea about the objects, again, is that essentially the very same things, transformations in the world, that a lot of people like Alexander von Humboldt and Adolf Bastian and Felix von Luschan to travel all over the world and create these collections were also causing radical transformations in those worlds. So as Bastian went, for example, to the American West Coast around Oregon, he saw in the Columbia River Gorge complete transformation of cultures and societies. And he recognized that the entire Western coast of the United States and Canada had a huge amount to tell us about the interrelationships between cultures on both sides of the Pacific. 
but the records of those interconnections were about to disappear because everything, the cultures, the people, the objects are all ephemeral. Um, they would all go away. So he launched a huge expedition to the British, uh, the, uh, to British Columbia, basically, um, to the West Coast to try and get as many of these objects as they could and bring them into a place where they could preserve them and then hold this data, basically, until they could put it into a comparative analysis. So this goal to accumulate as much as possible actually has a lot of value. The Faustian bargain was, how do you get it all? What are you willing to give up in order to get it? And one of the things that Bastian ended up willing to give up was only having ethnologists collect. Basically, he would take stuff from anyone. Now, there was a hierarchy on what was a well-collected object and a not well-collected object. But in the end, the more the better, which also meant that he was more than willing to work with, when it was necessary, people in colonial situations, including the actual colonial officers and soldiers themselves. And he knew that that means that sometimes these things were just taken. Um, but his, his feeling was these colonial troops are ravishing these areas. Either we can get the stuff from them or we won't get the stuff at all. And Lushan believed this as well. Lushan was also willing to work with, uh, with people who were in colonial situations. And as Germany becomes a colonial power, they work directly with them. But they also worked in non-German colonial period, uh, areas as well. So the Faustian bargain is just that, that they're basically making deals with the devil in order to support their science. Um, and that has left, a, well, I guess you could say a tainted legacy on the collections themselves. And Lushan's role here doesn't only link into the early 20th century history of German ethnology, but also the, the World War II and post-war history of German ethnology as well. How's that? Right? Can you, well, in, in the book, you talk about how he uh, played a role in the, in the post-war um, uh, sort of whitewashing of ethnology. Oh, I think you're confusing him with Franz Tamer because Lucian oh, is in the middle I, of the 20s. That, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, so Lucian passes away in the 1920s. Um, right. And then, so Franz Tamer, who is the subject of the fourth chapter, who works a lot on Guatemala, uh, yeah, he too is an interesting figure because on the one hand, he has to survive national socialism. And he's running a museum in Hamburg. He's one of the leading figures in what was still called Volkerkunde or German ethnology um, in the 1920s and into the 1930s. And he sees his science become less and less important. Students stop taking it. They're all going to physical anthropology or archaeology or what's called Volkskunde or folklore studies. And the state's not really supporting what he does anymore. They're not really supporting his museum. He's having terrible difficulty during the 30s being able to do any research uh, because once the war starts, you can't travel anymore. And then, of course, when the war comes to the end and the second world war in Hamburg is firebombed. Um, and so he, like all the other directors of museums has to try and find a way to one survive uh, the end of the war and to find a way to get his museum and his collections through the end of the war as well. So there's a huge history of uh, what do you do with the collections? Some of them are hidden in mines. Some of them are hidden in bunkers. Some of them are left in basements. And then there's the post-war of trying to clean up and figure out, well, which objects survived, how many ethnologists and anthropologists survived, and how many, well, how many museums actually survived, because some of them were completely destroyed. The one in Berlin um, was destroyed and eventually was, was knocked down um, and doesn't exist anymore. But the, the thing you're getting at is that when Tamar uh, comes back at the end of the Second World War and tries to rebuild the profession, he's unwilling to in any direct way, point fig his finger at his colleagues who worked with the National Socialists or joined the National Socialists, or not just joined, but completely embraced the National Socialists and helped to, well, you know, point their own fingers at Jewish ethnologists or anthropologists or other people or anyone else they didn't like. And this went on in that profession, just as it went on in every profession. So Tamar, like many people in Germany after the Second World War, went out of his way to play down that side of the story and try and play up the fact that Volkerkunde itself was a victim of National Socialism. 
which is not completely accurate because most of the people were engaged in ethnology at the time. A lot of them were also physical anthropologists who did very well under national socialism. Right, right. So, so now we've, I think we've gone through quite a, quite a number of characters in the story. Maybe now it would be a good time to focus on uh, one, of the, one of the most important objects in my reading of the book, which is the Yupik Flying Swan Mask. So would you mind telling us a bit about the Yupik Flying Swan Mask and its role in the story? Sure. The thing about the mask, there's a couple of things that are really important. One is that I, I mentioned just a few minutes ago about Adolf Bastian and the Pacific Northwest Coast. So the guy he has go to the Pacific Northwest Coast is a Norwegian named Adrian Jakobsen. And in the 1880s, he creates a gigantic collection um, from British Columbia, but also up into Alaska, where the Yupik are located. And this swan mask is one of the things he ends up bringing back. And it's a highly celebrated collection. And it's on display in the museum, parts of this collection, but this mask Essentially, as soon as they can get it into the museum, which takes a while, but is still on display after Bastian's death, after Jakobsen's death, through the interwar period. And it's one of the objects that is packed up and hidden during the, it, during the Second World War and then disappears along with tens of thousands of other objects because when the Soviets, the armies invaded Berlin, they rounded up as much stuff as they could from various museums. Well, they rounded up many other things as well. And they ended up acquire, uh, taking most of the objects that they could pull out of the Berlin Museum's bunkers um, with them back to Leningrad, where this particular mask sat for decades. And the interesting thing about this story is that for the ethnologists who were in Berlin, they knew that a lot of this stuff had disappeared, but they didn't know which things were where. They didn't know which things had been destroyed, which things had been taken by the Soviets, how many of those had actually been preserved. If any of them had been preserved, they'd heard rumors, um, but they, they were unsure. And in fact, a lot of the Benin bronzes, for example, were in the Soviet Union. And then during the period of the Cold War, what essentially happens is that the East Germans try and build up their claim to German high culture by refurbishing the Museum Island in downtown Berlin and a lot of these German collections get sent back to East Berlin. But East Berlin had no ethnological museum. That was on the west side of the, the wall. And the Dahlem Museum, which was in West Berlin, they couldn't very well send this stuff back to them because that didn't really make sense. So they sent it to Leipzig, which was the place with the largest ethnological museum in East Germany. But the people in Leipzig had no idea what to do with this collection of tens of thousands of objects. So essentially it stayed in storage there until the early 1990s and unification. And then the East German Museum and the West German Museum sent the things back. And the Yupik flying swan mass comes out of the box, essentially destroyed. And the and people like Peter Peter Boltz, who was is the director, was the director of the American collections at the time, painstakingly did oral histories and reconstituted that mask, put it back together until it could be put back up onto displays. Uh, now this is important for all kinds of reasons. Uh, we could have many conversations about it, but I think the one that, that you're getting at is that there's a group of Yupik elders who end up shortly thereafter with the help of an anthropologist um, from North America coming to the Berlin museum and having an incredibly successful time sitting together with Pedro Boltz and other members of the museum and going through all of these Yubik collections, which had been, not even in Berlin, but had been unpacked and refurbished by these curators. And as they did this, they rebuilt together histories of Yupik in Alaska from a century earlier. And one of the remarks that the elders made and the anthropologists that came with them uh, was that Adrian Jakobsen, during his collecting, had actually packed away from them an amazing gift. And this was the gift of knowledge about the past. The other thing that makes the Yupik mask a, a good example and an interesting example is that 
in an age in which a lot of the debates about what we could do with these objects turns around questions of repatriation, there were none of these people from the Yupik or none of these Yupik who were interested in taking this mask back to Alaska. Because the thing about these masks is that they were made for single uses. And in this case, this mask was used to encourage the birds to come back to the to this part of Alaska in the spring and bring nutritious eggs that were collected for people, right? And so you would use this through this part of this performance, through this part of a ritual. And after that was done, these kinds of masks were discarded and they were remade every year. So this wasn't an object that would have a purpose necessarily, and they liked the way it had been cared for in Berlin. And I thought this was important to include, again, because it shows more complexity for discussions about questions like repatriation. Yeah, here here we're really talking in your book about history with a purpose, so to speak, right? You're not just writing history for the the sake of it. You, you have a, a meaning behind it in this story. So can you tell us a little bit about what you think the role of such objects are today in ethnological museums and some of the things we can do with them? Right. Um, so I think the most important thing to understand about the objects is that uh, – they're historical texts. They're things from the past. And they have a lot to teach us about human history. And sometimes that can be very specific local histories, very specific places in Alaska, very specific groups of people. And sometimes they can be involved in bigger questions about broader areas of different kinds of people. It's still possible to do the kinds of comparative analysis that Bastian once envisioned. It's still possible to use the objects to produce knowledge. And what we know is, and, and this is the thing that, that everyone forgets, we tend to think that museums are places where curators work, and they work with objects, and they discover things, and then they tell publics about them. But that's not how Bastian saw it. He saw it as these are places where we all work together with the objects. The objects teach us to see things. And juxtaposing the objects is one way to do this. And the people involved in that process may be curators, but they also may be publics. They may be also people from... Well, the term that used to be common was source communities, but let's just say the descendants of the people who originally produced the objects. And that's the thing about the Yupik elders, is that these were people who had cognizance of these kinds of objects, but may not have actually seen them before, or they may have not seen the same ones, or they'd seen similar kinds of things. So bringing together people with different backgrounds allowed them to produce a lot of knowledge that not only benefited these Yupik, but also the curators themselves and anybody else who wants to learn about this part of human history, right? So the goal, I think, is to unleash these objects, to get them out of cold storage, to get them up and in publics and have people working with them. And one of the things I would like to see happen, and one of the arguments I made in the book is that it's just a pity that you can put hundreds of millions of euros into the creation of an edifice in downtown Berlin to allow Berlin to show itself to the world and very little money in comparison to doing original research with the objects so that Berlin can learn about the world itself, right? And this is what I'd like to see happen, is doing anthropology in the museums, not just having museums being places for expressions of what anthropologists think. And that, that sort of brings me to another point that you make, which is about the connection between anthropological museums and anthropology departments. So can you speak a little bit about your point in the book about the connections or lack thereof. Yeah, so I, you know, when I went to when I went to graduate school, there were a lot of people who became really interested in material culture, and um, you know, the funny thing was that it, they would write about it, they theorize it, they talk about it, but very few people went and started working with people who had been working in museums who actually been doing the kinds of things that we've been discussing, um, and the reasons for that because in the second half of the twentieth century, museums sort of fell out of fashion as research centers, as places where well, where you had scholars. Um, now, when I say that, some people may have been working in those places at that time and thought of themselves as scholars could be offended. And I don't mean to offend them. What I mean to point out is that a lot of other people had forgotten that these were also scholarly institutions, that they have were research institutions. They had value in that way. And the interesting transformation that's taken place is that by the end of the 20th century, people started to remember this. They started to see the possibility of working with these collections. 
And, you know, I have to actually give uh, the United States and NAGRA, NAGPRA a big, a big plug here and say that one of the things that was great about the laws that were passed in the United States is it required curators to work with indigenous groups who would make claims on objects and especially body parts that'd be held in those institutions. But as this happened, as these groups started to interact with each other, people started to recognize, well, wait a minute, we can learn a lot more from these objects than we ever thought we could. And these people who are coming here making claims are helping us to do that. And we're helping them. This doesn't have to be an end repatriation. This could be a beginning of working relationships. And, and that's, where I, that's where I, again, where I see where I'd like to see museums going. And this is something that universities can benefit from too. Because, you know, when I started doing my research in the 1990s, the, the guy who was teaching at one of the guys who was teaching anthropology at Hamburg University, his office was still in the Ethnological Museum. He still gave lectures in the Ethnological Museum. The hallways in the basement were filled with graduate students. That was one of the last places where that was like that. And it's not like that anymore. But I think it'd be great if it was again, because I think it would be great to get students in working with the objects, working and professors in working with the objects and the curators and other people who could work with them together to bring together a big joint project. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And in, in, uh, towards the end of the book, though, you do mention that despite the fact that you are inspired by Bastian's dream, you, you're not very uh, interested in returning to Bastian's museum outline, right? That his museum was a little... Yeah, no, so the, the point is not to just say, look, you know, we can go back and take his original architecture and, and, and rebuild it and, and put a bunch of stuff in the museums and it'll all be fine. That's not it. Um, I mean, Bastian recognized the limitations. The thing he did most successfully was create a place that had saved a lot of information um, by saving a lot of objects that would have disappeared. And now we can build on that and we can think about what does it mean when you put or you juxtapose lots of different objects? What can they teach us to see? And there's ways in which we can do this. And particularly now with, I think, some pretty impressive transformations of what today is called the digital humanities. There's ways in which we could actually create these spatial juxtapositions without necessarily having to have the physical space. I'm not an expert on the technology, but what I've already, I've seen a lot of, I've had a lot of discussions with people who work on, uh, who can work in the IT world. And I think there's a, there's an argument to be made that a combination of both working with the physical tactile objects and using the advances of well, digital technology, we could actually create, we could create digital spaces in which we could juxtapose objects and put out entire collections in ways that, well, Boston just couldn't do. I still think one of the most creative ideas he ever had was creating a kind of crystal palace in which it was an ever expanding museum that was filled with natural light and with walls that were made out of glass. So you could look across thousands and thousands of objects and think about the juxtapositions or have them make you think in new ways. But of course, it was never built because it was impractical. But there's some ways I think in which technology today would allow us to do just that kind of thing. We just have to get the right minds together. Oh, that's brilliant. So as a, as a concluding remark, could you tell us about what you're working on at the moment? Yeah. So, you know, the, the funny thing is that uh, uh, during COVID-19, uh, during the, the, most, uh, the most recent lockdowns of COVID-19, I was able to actually write that book that I was supposed to write at the Wissenschaftskolleg, which is coming out with Cambridge, and it's, it's called um, German History Unbound. Um, but since I've done that, I continue to work on essentially German interconnections with Latin America, um, some of which are scientists, some of which are migrants, some of which are travelers, and some of which are just people who, well, live in multiple societies simultaneously. So I'm sitting in Munich right now, um, very engrossed in the southern German borderlands, because one of the things I realized is that a lot of the people that I work on or think about who were in places like Chile actually came from here. And a lot of the integration of those German-speaking communities, I realized, well, if I really want to understand the things they were doing and why they were doing it, uh, it would behoove me, I guess you could say, to better understand the places they came from. So I'm trying to figure out mobility, migration, interconnections in the southern German borderlands so I can better understand exactly those same things in the Americas. That's wonderful. Looking forward to reading it. So am I. <laughs> <laughs>
H. Glenn thank you so much for your time. Well, I appreciate it. And uh, I look forward to talking to you again sometime. Okay, great. Thanks very much.